what people found appealing 50 years ago is very different from today. Science would have us believe that the traits many find attractive are driven by biology. But there's something else at play. What's in style? Here's a look at what traits men found attractive in the 1960s and 70s. Until Twiggy came along in 1967, the ideal female body type was hourglass-shaped, featuring what the New York Times described as fleshy, deliciously rounded arms and shoulders, pointy bras, and tight-waisted girdles. The 91-pound British model, born Leslie Hornby, was the quote, anti-woman, with no breasts and bony shoulders. The clothes are all right, but some of them, um, especially for me because I'm so thin, they're miles too big and I've got pins everywhere. The New York Times wrote, she cast a gargantuan shadow over the image of the American housewife, a lovable species that would soon become extinct. Unfortunately, the popularity of Twiggy and similarly thin models gave rise to disordered eating and diet pill abuse in the 70s. Of course, none of this is actually the fault of Twiggy. While everyday men and women alike may have found this super thin look attractive, they're also not to be blamed. According to Hamilton College, it's much more likely a function of what people were seeing in the media at the time. Twiggy defined one of the most fetishized looks of the late 1960s, that of large eyes and normal-sized, albeit well-shaped, lips. While there's definitely an argument that beauty standards of the 1970s took those normal-sized yet well-shaped lips and turned them big and juicy, there's an equally strong argument that the 1970s were a time when thinner lips were very much coveted by women and desired by men. Popular 1970s model Cheryl Teagues is proof of that. This makes sense, given that collagen injections were not even invented until the late 70s. And at that time, they were used not for lip augmentation, but to fill in wrinkles and depressions on the skin. According to the Baltimore Sun, the plump lip trend really only got going in the late 1980s after actress Barbara Hershey had her lips augmented before shooting the film Beaches. At the outset of her modeling career, Lauren Hutton was pressured into covering the gap between her front teeth with mortician's wax, the actor and model admitted to Vogue in December 2020. Even after Hutton landed the biggest major modeling contract in history in 1973, she was still, at times, pressured into covering that gap. In an interview with Harper's Bazaar, Hutton recalled, Revlon wanted me to use a cap all the time. And then the construction workers would yell at me in the street, Hey Lauren, why did you fill in your space? We don't like you anymore. So I would turn and give them a great big grin, and they would cheer. Yeah, I had to have everything fixed, but I didn't fix it. I just sort of faked it. As Hutton began to embrace her dental imperfection, the gap between her front teeth became her signature. It's widely believed that Hutton helped usher in a new age of imperfection is beauty, paving the way for other unconventional beauties, like Vanessa Perdi, Jessica Pere, Jorge Fox, and Uzo Aduba in the decades to come. In the 1960s, a movement was growing among black women that came down to, as journalist Princess Gabara wrote in Ebony Magazine, to hell with that! As the Black is Beautiful movement caught momentum, black women began to reject, quote, European beauty standards and take back their hair. Don't be ashamed of your color. Don't be ashamed of your hair. I am black and beautiful. The Afro hairstyle emerged as a symbol of black beauty, liberation, and pride. At the dawn of the 1970s, the Afro was associated with strength, thanks to films like Shaft and Foxy Brown. But as the decade wore on, entertainers like the Jackson 5 and Billy Preston brought the Afro much more into the mainstream. Given the Afro's association with statement-making, its mainstream acceptance may well have been the death knell of its popularity. By the 1980s, the Afro had all but disappeared, but not forever. According to Gabara, and from what we can see today, the Afro is back. While it's come and gone for many years, the no-makeup makeup look really got rolling in the 1970s, as the healthy is beautiful trend gained momentum, according to the Washington Post. Long before the advent of social media and selfies, high-end fashion magazines were beginning to feature the youthful, fresh-faced dewy look. What haute couture influencers dictated ultimately trickled down to the masses. This resulted in mainstream magazines running ads for such products as Yardley's Pot of Gloss, a line of subtly tinted, barely-there lip gloss. 
The fact that incredibly long hair was seen as attractive by heterosexual men during the 1970s isn't exactly surprising. In fact, it's consistent with evolutionary theory. According to Psychology Today, throughout history, long hair has been considered more attractive on women than short hair. A 2015 research paper published in Advances in Anthropology traced the evolution of head hair in humans and found that women's hair is biologically programmed to grow longer than men's. What may be surprising, however, is how evolutionary theory dovetailed with media influence to make the endless locks rocked by Cher, Ally McGraw, and Marlo Thomas during the 1970s so desirable at the time. If I pick up another magazine with my face on the cover, I'm going to throw up. According to a 2004 research paper published in the journal Human Nature, men don't just find women with long hair more attractive, they actually believe they are healthier. And this healthy is beautiful trend was just finding its footing in the 1970s, according to the Washington Post. Prior to the 1920s, pale skin was in, according to The Guardian. Back then, it signified that one possessed enough wealth to avoid engaging in manual and outdoor labor. By the 1960s, however, a suntan had become a signifier of wealth. It meant that you had the time and the money to fly and vacation in warmer climates. By the 1970s, the fashion industry had taken note, and Vogue began featuring models with glistening, suntanned skin. Throughout much of the 70s, you couldn't be tan enough. When the first officially SPF-rated sunscreens came out in 1978, they came in a maximum of SPF 15, according to the FDA. That may sound shocking, but science didn't really begin to make the connection between skin cancer and sun exposure until the 1980s. It would be easy to link the rise of androgyny as an attractiveness ideal during the 1970s to the twiggy-thin aesthetic that prevailed starting in the late 1960s. However, androgyny works both ways, and by definition, impacts everyone. That's why it may be at least equally accurate to link the trend toward androgyny with David Bowie, whose third album, which dropped in 1970, featured a photo of him on the cover wearing a dress and sporting long hair. Although Bowie was criticized for the decision at the time, the look clearly made an indelible impact, whether consciously or unconsciously, in the minds of the general population. So I'm a storyteller and a story writer, and uh, I decided that I preferred to enact a lot of the material I was writing rather than perform it as myself. That may be because it came at a good time. The early 1970s saw the rise not only of Bowie and others in the glam rock scene, but also of punk rock which also carried a strong undercurrent of androgyny. While trends were trickling down from haute couture into the mainstream throughout the first half of the 1970s, there was a rebellious streak that had continued from the 1960s, reaching a fever pitch in 1976. In a 2016 story commemorating the 40th anniversary of the birth of punk rock, Rolling Stone wrote, punk rock began as a kind of negation, a call to stark, brutal simplicity. A year later, fashion designer Vivian Westwood, who famously attired the Sex Pistols, had delivered punk fashion into the mainstream. Teenage girls and young women began dyeing their hair Deborah Harry Platinum, slashing dark eyeliner across their eyelids and beyond, just like Blondie's lead singer did. And men who were feeling rebellious took the opportunity to take a break from worshipping the freshly scrubbed Cheryl Teagues and Christy Brinkley to falling for bad girls like Patti Smith, Chrissy Hind, and Joan Jett. The notion that a fit, athletic female could be attractive to men was once virtually non-existent, psychologist Linda Lynn explained in an article for The Daily Burn. With the advent of the healthy is beautiful trend throughout the late 1960s, however, men were increasingly exposed to images of beautiful women who cultivated strength and athletic skills. There was Farrah Fawcett, looking fit in her iconic 1978 swimsuit poster. And who could forget the 1978 Linda Ronstadt album cover for Living in the USA, which featured Ronstadt rocking short shorts and roller skates. Although an even more muscular female archetype was quietly developing in the background, it wouldn't hit the mainstream until 1994, with the release of Terminator 2, starring Linda Hamilton and her killer arms. Good morning, Dr. Silberman. Throughout much of the 1970s, cigarette brand Virginia Slims marketed long, skinny cigarettes to women by employing long, skinny models and actresses 
to play cool, sophisticated women who identified with the brand's tagline, You've come a long way, baby. By deliberately playing to both the first and second waves of feminism, the brand made smoking among women seem not just desirable, but downright sexy. Tailored slim for your hands, for your lips. Virginia Slims. According to The Atlantic, the ads evoked elegance and daintiness, and were thus marketed to women of the time. But the imagery and language of the ads clearly also spoke to men. The publication explained, what women of the 70s really wanted, the mostly male, mostly white advertisers of the time assumed, was similar to what many of them still want today, despite all the progress that has been made in the meantime, to be attractive to men. In effect, the ads eroticized smoking both for women and for the men who would now bear witness to their smoking. Indeed, according to Gallup, a whopping 40% of the population smoked throughout the early 1970s. Feminism's first wave took place around the turn of the 20th century, with women's suffrage as its primary goal. The second wave of feminism began growing in the late 1960s, fueled by the anti-war and civil rights movements. As the 1970s dawned, feminism came to be helmed by Gloria Steinem, a feminist intellect beautiful enough to fool the Playboy Club into hiring her, whereupon she wrote and published a powerful exposé. The movement's focus became increasingly about sexuality, including reproductive rights. The 1970s were so feminism-forward, in fact, that the decade spawned what was, according to Vice, a men's liberation movement, which was comprised of men who supported women's rights and whose girlfriends and wives were proud feminists. Sexual revolution or sexual renaissance? The experts are still trying to define it. Some people believe the 1960s ushered in the sexual revolution, but British historian Dominic Sandbrook takes a different stance. Writing for the Daily Mail, he said, Before the early 70s, having sex had immense emotional, economic, and symbolic weight attached to it because to sleep with another person was tantamount to choosing them as a life partner. The increased availability of the birth control pill during the 1970s changed all that. So too did the 1972 publication of the best-selling and groundbreaking The Joy of Sex. According to Sandbrook, by the mid-70s, books and films of the time show an entirely different world, where men and women were having sex with anyone they fancied, because the availability of contraception and abortion had taken the danger out of it. Many men and women of the time also embraced the concept of free love, which was different from promiscuity. As PBS explained, it meant an absence of legal ties. The 1970s didn't just validate premarital intimacy, it also validated postmarital sexual exploration. In his 1997 review of The Ice Storm, Roger Ebert wrote, The early 1970s were a time when the social revolution of the 1960s had seeped down, or up, into the yuppie classes, who wanted to be with it and supplemented their martinis with reefer. Set in 1973 New Canaan, Connecticut, the film depicts such trickling into the conservative bastion of white upper-middle-class values. Sigourney Weaver's character, Janie Carver, is the one most committed to sexual exploration for its own sake, and is arguably the film's most attractive, most authentic, and possibly most sympathetic adult character. Although the movie came out in the 90s, it was pretty on the money regarding sexual exploration of the 70s. In fact, the book Open Marriage, A New Lifestyle for Couples was released in 1972, and it became a bestseller at the time. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Health Digest videos about beauty trends are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.